Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, today we're going to be talking about are you looking sound doctrine dispensations. All right. So this is going to be a multi-part study. So for the first part we're going to go over a little bit about what dispensations are. And we're going to go over some verses to keep in mind as we're going through all these different dispensations. Now everybody, I've watched videos on multiple preachers preaching uh, dispensations just slightly differently. Some of them are really, really off. But I just wanted to teach with you, brothers and Christ, what God's put on my heart, what I believe the different dispensations are. But the point is, is there are dispensations. And you're going to have people that come along that say, there are no dispensations. Uh, they're wrong. Okay? But dispensation is a Bible word. Okay? And there are dispensations. And what's, we're gonna, I don't want to get ahead of myself. So... Turn to 1 Corinthians 9.17. We're going to go through every time the word dispensation is mentioned. 1 Corinthians 9.17. Get out your King James Bibles. And make sure you're following along. King James Bible, God's perfect written word in English. All the other Bible perversions... Uh, don't mess with them. Don't have anything to do with them. Do the Bible version issue study. I've got we did a whole uh, series on the Word of God, and uh, I've got videos on Bible version issues. Um, just stay away from them. Do the study to know that this is the God's perfect written word. And then when you get the God's perfect written word, don't let it go. Hold on to it. Don't let it go. All right. So First Corinthians nine seventeen we read. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if, it, but if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. There we see a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Now as we get through this, you're going to realize that when we talk about the dispensation of the gospel that's given to me, it's how God dispenses his grace. But more importantly, how I teach, brothers and sisters Christ, it's how, how mankind, his creation, how we find God's grace. God's grace is there in every dispensation. I'm getting ahead of myself. Right? God's grace is there in every dispensation. God is saving mankind in every dispensation. But how we find that grace is not the same in every dispensation. Okay? So there's the first time you see dispensation mentioned. Okay? Turn to Ephesians 1.10. So that's just one time. Remember if it's one time, yeah, it's occasionally... Is it mentioned again, Ephesians? Ephesians one ten. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times. All dispensations, okay, the, the dispensations of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now remember, uh, Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross, when he was raised from the dead, he went down to Abraham's bosom and got the Old Testament saints from the Old Testament. They were not saved by looking forward to the cross, which we're going to talk as we go through these different dispensations. Okay, their blood was covered, so they were saved, they found God's grace, and they went to Abraham's bosom, but they couldn't go to heaven until Jesus Christ, the ultimate blood sacrifice, when Jesus Christ said, it is finished. It is finished. He's going to unite everybody. Okay, the Old Testament saints go up. That's the first fruits. The time, uh, in the church age, time of the Gentiles, okay, when we have the catching away. There's the, uh, you have the first fruits, that's the harvest. And then after we leave, the time of Jacob's trouble, there are going to be some saints, like Old Testament saints, there's going to be saints in the time of Jacob's trouble that get saved. Okay? Some are going to get caught up, some have to rest for a season. That's a whole other study. But that's called the gleanings, the la when, when the fruit tree, it's all talking about the fruit tree. When the fruit tree starts giving fruit, I've got two fruit trees out there. I'll see some fruit at the very beginning of spring, at the end of summer, there'll be tons of fruit. And then through fall, 
before winter sets in, you might see one, two, or one, two or three more fruit that, that are just taking their time, the last bits of fruit that's on the tree. And that's the whole point, okay? In the dispensation of the fullness of times, God will gather uh, the, the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ. The Old Testament saints aren't in Christ until Jesus Christ dies, goes down to Abraham's bosom and preaches to him and leads captivity captive and frees him and brings him to heaven. But in the Old Testament, we're going to go through here. Are they looking forward to the cross? That's one of the big lies. Okay? People who attack dispensational teaching, salvation's always been the same from the very beginning. We're going to find out if that is true. Instead of just taking people's word for it, don't be part of an occult, brothers and sisters of Christ. Instead of just taking someone's word for it, how about we do a study on it? How about you do a study on it? How about you look into it? Okay. But I'm here, we can do a study together, and don't just stop on my study. Expand the study. Do more. Okay. There's always things that I can put in here. I don't put everything in here. So we've got Ephesians 1.10, Ephesians 3.2, twice in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians 3, chapter 2. We see it again. If ye have heard of the dispensation of grace of God which is given me to you word. He's talking about how God dispenses his grace in this time period, the church age. Paul's like, in this time period, that God shared with me to share with you. It's, did, he's being, it's being dispensed. All right. Uh, Colossians 1.25, how, how people find God's grace. Paul's like, here, let me show you how you find God's grace today. And we're going to go through dispensationally, and we're going to go through each dispensation and find out how mankind found God's grace in the past. And then we're going to get to the present, and then we're going to get to the future. Right. Colossians 1.25, just going along in order. Colossians 1.25, Now, why is this being mentioned today? If you notice, a lot of the times, all the times dispensations mentioned, it's in the New Testament, the Pauline epistles. Why? Because something changed. Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross. He said, it is finished. A lot of people are still trying to go off the Old Testament. So he has to say, hey, this is a new way God is dispensing his grace. It's not the same in the Old Testament. It's a new way. Here's how you get saved today. You can't get saved the way you got saved in the Old Testament. It won't work today. That's why he's having to say there's a new dispensation of grace. Here's the new, here's the new way to find God's grace. An old study we did, we did a chart on how to find God's grace. There's steps, like, you're, like it's a treasure map. We did it like a treasure map. And there were steps that you have to follow the steps to find the X that marks the spot where you find the buried treasure. Okay? There's instructions on how to find God's grace. It's the dispensation. The instructions is the dispensation. How do you find God's grace today? How do you find God's grace in the Old Testament? How do you find God's grace in the future, in the time of Jacob's trouble, in the day of the Lord? How do you find God's grace? It's an instruction map. And we did a whole study on this. And if you mess up and you skip any part of the instruction, you will not find the X. You will not find the buried treasure. You will not find God's grace. Today people are trying to skip repentance. They're trying to take prayer out. They're trying to find, take out confessing both your repentance, your sinful wicked state, and where you're going because of it, and that you deserve to go there because of it, and confessing that you believe here that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh, and it's only God's blood that can, shed, that can wash your sins away. And that he died and was buried. How he died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day. They try to take that out. They take steps out. And the next thing you know, what do you get? What do you get when you take steps out of the true plan of salvation? The dispensation of grace. The dispensation of the gospel that Paul's preaching today. What happens when you take steps out? People, you get false converts. False sense of security. Oh, I get to go to heaven when I die. And they continue living however they want to live. Worldly. And we're going to talk about this in the second dispensation. How worldly people get in the second dispensation. Why? Because they're their own boss. They're their own final authority. They decide what's right and what's wrong. Does that sound a lot like today? 
Oh yeah. Amen. Uh, sorry to go off too much on that, but Colossians 1.25, we just read that, Where have I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fill the word of God? Amen. So we know that there are di divisions in the Bible, because it says dispensation. Paul's having to say, the way God dispensed his grace in the past, how you had to find it, is not the same way as today. Let me show you what God has revealed to me today, the gospel that God has revealed to me to you, word. Here's the gospel today. In other words, in order for him to have to say that, brothers is Christ, it means it wasn't the same in the past. If it was the same in the past, Paul would just have to say, get saved, like you always have. Get saved. But he has to come forward and make a big deal and say, hey, it's a new dispensation. Of, we're in a new dispensation, and here's the, how you find God's grace. Here's the gospel for today. It's not the same as in the past. And we're going to find that out by actually going to the past. We're going to go to the Old Testament. Okay. So it says, so we know where the divisions of the Bible. How do we find the divisions? See, that's the big thing I just said. When I listen to a lot of people's different versions of this dispensation, that dispensation, okay, what are they trying to do? They're trying to do, some of them are trying to do 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing. Okay, you'll see that something changes. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But they rightly divide the word of truth and say, okay, here's divisions. Okay? Okay, finding God's grace here isn't the same as finding God's grace here. The commandments here that please God isn't the same as the commandments here that please God. Okay? How to find God's grace? Okay, there's a, there's a division. It changed. Something happened and it changed, and now here's the new way to find God's grace. Then something happened and it changed. Here's the new way to find God's grace. God's grace is always there in every dispensation. I've never denied that, brothers and Christ. And a lot of and brethren that teach true dispensation, um, they never deny it. God's grace is always there in every dispensation. We're going to find this out. Okay. We're going to go through every dispensation of the Bible, and I would like to remind you of these verses as we're going through them. Okay. Colossians 1.16. We're already here, Colossians 1.16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, or dominions, or principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Jesus, is the, Jesus who is God, and we've already done a study on this, I don't want to go into it too much, but how God has a body throughout eternity. He's got an incorruptible body in the Old Testament. He, God the Father gives up his incorruptible body to come down in, in the likeness of sinful flesh and it becomes his son, Jesus Christ. But it's still the body of God. Okay? It's still the body of God. Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. In the Old Testament, there's God manifest in the flesh. He's there. He's dealing with sinful, wicked man through his body. Remember, sin can't be in God the Father's presence. So he sends his body down, or he sends his son, which is the same, it's just a different name. He's not known as capital S, Son of Man, or capital S, Son of God. He's not known as Jesus. That's not revealed to us until he comes in the likeness of sinful flesh. But in the Old Testament, he's referred to the angel of the Lord, an angel of the Lord. And we did one study where he showed where he said, that man, <laughs> he's just, he's a man. God manifests in the flesh is coming down and dealing with mankind in the Old Testament. That's there too. Okay. But God, through Jesus Christ, created everything. And we know that Revelation, I've turned there, but Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Okay? They were created. I'm just going over a study we did recently. They were created to please God. What pleases God? Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Like I said, we just did this study recently. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Why was mankind created? To fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. The reason I'm doing this is in every dispensation, we're to fear God and keep His commandments. How do we find God's grace? The commandments are not always the same. 
The laws of God that we're going to talk about are written on our hearts are the same. We know what's, e what's wicked and sin what's, what's right and what's wrong. It's on our hearts. But God gives commandments. When we fail God, what are we supposed to do? How do we find God's grace when we fail Him here? Okay. Fear God, keep His commandments. You know, I got three thumbs down on our last study we did on sin. What the Bible say is sin. Why man was, what we're talking about here, why man was created to fear God and keep his commandments. I got three, three thumbs down. Well, I don't like that. And we're going to read a verse in here about how men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Neither do they come to the light lest their deeds be reproved. The hardest thing about dealing with professing fake, what I call false, fake Christians, the Bible, uh, Paul calls them false brethren, is they've got a false sense of self-righteousness. Now, I don't believe, like I said, they can't have their own righteousness, but they have a false sense of, I am righteous. I'm a good person. Okay? I get to go to heaven when I die. But they still love their sin. They, they still love their sin. They want their sin. They don't want to let go of their sin. They don't fear God. That's one of the biggest signs of these false converts. Where is the fear of God? They don't fear God. And they're not keeping His commandments. And they have the whole attitude. They're, most of them are against there being a perfect written word. I was dealing with someone on YouTube. They're against a perfect written word, a perfect standard, God's standard that we are held accountable to. God is in charge. What did we just read there? Fear God and keep His commandments. But if there's no perfect written word today, then who's to say what his commandments are? Ye can be as God's knowing good and evil. Yea, hath God said. And we're going to get into that. Yea, hath God said. Ye can be as God's knowing good and evil. You get to decide what's right and wrong. And that's why I believe they gave me three thumbs down. Those people, they love their sin. They love having the authority to say what is sin and what isn't sin because they don't want a perfect authority. I have a perfect authority, brother says Christ, you have a perfect authority. You can hold me accountable to this book, and I can hold you accountable to this book. And what my, what I, what's really hurt me these days, I don't want to go off too much, but it's really been on my heart, sorrow of the heart, as I'm seeing brethren, they're starting to go back to their old man, where they don't fear God, and His commandments aren't the final authority. They go back to doing things the world's way, the flesh's way. They're turning their back on God's Word, and where's the fear of God? Okay. But I want you to keep these verses in mind as we go through the different dispensations. In every dispensation, dispensation, there's supposed to be fear of God, and they're supposed to be keeping His commandments. Okay. Every dispensation. Except, I threw in an extra dispensation. Most people just say seven. I threw in an eighth one, which we'll get to eventually. We're only going to get through two dispensations in this study, part one. But I threw in an eighth dispensation, a new beginning. That's what number eight is. Seven is completion. Eight is a new beginning. Okay? I threw in eternity. Past. After the day of the Lord. That's the eighth dispens uh, seventh dispensation is the day of the Lord. And then you have the great white throne judgment. Old, uh, the old earth is burned away. Old heaven is destroyed. And we get a new earth and new heaven. That's the eighth dispensation. Going out into eternity. New Jerusalem coming down. Right? We'll get into that in more detail with scripture. When we get to it. Okay. But fearing God and keeping His commandments is in every dispensation. Okay. Uh, Hebrews 9.22 And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Another thing I want you to keep track of is as we go through these different dispensations, know how, notice how blood has to be shed because of sin. And it's not until Jesus Christ, the ultimate sacrifice, that he says, it is finished, that the sacrificing animals stops. That the spilling of blood stops. He's the ultimate sacrifice. But in the Old Testament, as we're going to read, they're shedding blood. And now it's through Jesus Christ and through his blood that people get saved. Until you get to the day of the Lord. Okay? All the way up to the day of the Lord. 
But we're going to find that the shedding of blood is in, all, uh, is in a lot of different dispensations, all, all the dispensations up to the dispensation of grace that's given to us today through Jesus Christ, God sacrificing His Son, His body, on the cross. And why I keep saying that, brothers and Christ? Because the Bible says, uh, feed the church of God, which He hath purchased with His own blood. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, there's but one capital G, God the Father. So when it says, feed the church of capital G, God, which He hath purchased with His own blood, God there is a reference to the Father. Sacrificing His Son, His body on the cross, and shedding His blood. Jesus' blood is God's blood. All right? I'm sorry, I just get some people that, that still fight this. The pagan Trinitarians. And the Godhead is truth. Trinitar Trinity is Catholic. Godhead is truth. That's a whole other study we'll get into. But almost all things are, are by the law, purged with blood, and without shedding of blood, there's no remission. That's Hebrews 9.22. There has to be shedding of blood up to a point until you get to the perfect sacrifice, which is Jesus Christ. John 19.30 says, When Jesus therefore have received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Holy Ghost. Uh, I don't want to get into this too much, but when he's on the cross, remember the teaching we had, brothers of Christ, he's on the cross, he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was the separation from God the Father and Jesus Christ. God the Father still in him. But the soul and the body aren't connected anymore because now the, the body can take on the sins of the world. Sin can't be in God the Father's presence. That was God letting us know that separation. And then when Jesus died, the Holy Ghost leaves. There's that separation. All right. Just a little footnote there. But the Holy Ghost leaves. But he says it is finished. In other words, no more animal sacrifices. And you get into Hebrews and start talking about how, how you, the, the, the blood of goats and rams and bulls can't take sin away. They can cover them. We just read them in Hebrews 9.22. They can cover sin, but it can't take them away. It takes a perfect, ultimate sacrifice. God's sacrifice. Jesus Christ, His blood, can wash your sins away permanently. Not cover them, wash them away. Okay. So we're going to remember these things, okay? God in every dispensation is saving man by His grace in sin and repentance. I'm going to read a few verses here about sin and repentance, okay? Sin is in every dispensation uh, except for eternity, right? Repentance is in every dispensation. And then we're supposed to believe, as we go through this, brothers and sisters, we're supposed to believe that sin, uh, repentance is in every dispensation except this dispensation. No repentance. Uh, no, this, repentance is in every dispensation. Okay? Coming to God when you have sinned against Him and repenting. And we're going to find that out. It's in every dispensation. Having sorrow of the heart. Okay? Ephesians 2.8 uh, We read, For by grace are ye saved. This is one of those memory verses. Ephesians 2.8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Today, it's faith. Okay? There's steps you have to take that require faith to find God's grace. Repentance is, is it takes faith to repent. It takes faith to believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. I wasn't there. I wasn't an eyewitness. Were you, brothers and sisters Christ? Then it takes faith. It takes faith to confess both in prayer to a God you can't see. What is faith? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You're confessing to a God that you can't see. You're humbling yourself. And then you're asking, call, call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. You're asking God to save you. You're asking God to save you. Right? All four of those steps, it takes faith, through faith. But what is doing the saving? Your faith doesn't save you. Today, you've got a lot of false converts out there that are trying to buy salvation with their faith. Your faith isn't what saves you. It's what you go through to find what? God's grace. Who does the saving? God does the saving. The Bible says God will have mercy on whom He will have mercy. And God will, I can't remember the second part. God will have vengeance, you know, judgment on who He will. 
But God will have mercy on who He will have mercy. God's the one that does the saving. Okay? Your faith can't save you. But God's grace, we see it today big time, but is God's grace there in the Old Testament? We're going to find out God's grace is there in every dispensation. There are just steps that you have to go through to find that grace, and mankind as a whole, as usual, just like today, are fighting God, and they don't want to go through the steps that God has set out there for them to find His grace. They want to do things their way. Ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. And the laws of God that are written on their heart, their attitude is, Yea, hath God said. And then, did God really mean that? Oh, I think we can do it this way. I feel, my opinion is, I feel. Yeah. But God's grace is there in every dispensation. But how you find that grace is different. Today, how do we find the grace today? I just explained it. The steps. The treasure map. Like I said, that we did that study, an old study on the gospel. The treasure map. How to find God's grace. How to find the buried treasure. The greatest treasure ever. Finding God's grace and getting saved. There's nothing down here in this world, brother, says Christ, that, that would, is worth us going to hell. The lost world, they're choosing it over Jesus Christ. These false converts, they're still choosing the world over Jesus Christ. The Bible says lovers, see, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. They're not giving their life completely to Jesus Christ. They still want the world. They still love their sin. And they get part of organized religion. They try to get an insurance card that they can have in their back pocket. So when it comes down to their white, great white throne, they can whip out that insurance card. See? See? I said the prayer. Uh, I believed. I believed. And we'll get into this in a whole other study, but we've already talked about in previous studies. Can you believe in vain? Can someone believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and still go to hell? Yes. You want a good example of that? Simon the sorcerer. He believed. Then he tried to buy the power of the Holy Ghost, because he didn't have it. He didn't have the Spirit, Holy Spirit. And they told him that your money should perish with thee. In other words, you're going to hell. But he believed. He believed. You can believe in vain. All right? Once again, God looks at the heart. God's the one that saves you. All right? But there are steps to find that treasure. There's nothing in this world that's worth preventing anyone to get saved. And I had to get to that point. Brother, this is Christ. You had to get to that point. We're going to read in the Old Testament the different dispensations, how they had to get to a point the same way, where they had to do things God's way. Not the world's way, nothing in this world. The world's way is not worth it. It's God's way that matters. Second right. Peter 3, 9. So God's grace is we're going to see is going to be there in every dispensation. 2 Peter 3.9 The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We're going to find out that repentance is in every dispensation, the seven dispensations before eternity. Okay, Repentance is in every dispensation. Every dispensation. You fail God, He doesn't send you directly to hell. We're going to find that out. He doesn't just send someone directly to hell when you sin against God. He gives you an opportunity to repent. Okay. Now, like I said, when we get into this, this is my belief. Okay, It might not use the word repent, but it's my belief. As we get into the different dispensations, I'm going to say, well, it didn't use the word repent, but God's given him a chance to repent. He could have judged him right there and sent him to hell, just like that. Why didn't he? He's given him time to repent. To come to God broken. I used to think when I was lost, using these Bible versions, these battle buildings, that the God of the Old Testament was different than the God of the New Testament. No, he wasn't. It's the same God. We have one God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay? He gave mankind, he looked at their heart. When men had hardened hearts and were so messed up by sin and they had hate for God, had hate for the love of God, uh, God's laws, remember loving God is keeping His word. God's laws that are written on every man's heart, they hate that, they want nothing to do with that. God can look at the heart and say, okay, they're just so hardened heart, and He goes ahead and deals with them. But He looks at the heart, and any man that had a heart that it looked like there might have been the slightest hope of repentance, He gave him a chance to repent. Okay. 
And we're going to see that. Okay? But repentance, we're going to find, is in, the, is in every dispensation. That's why it gets so confusing with some brethren. They want to believe that everything's the same across the board. It isn't. How do you find that God, God's grace? I explained how we find God's grace today. You need to get saved. You need to repent. Godly sorrow, having sorrow in your heart for sinning against Him. We'll go through it again. You need to believe that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 3 and 4. Okay. You need to confess both in prayer. It says, with the, he with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. That's where the belief needs to be. Not up here. Down here. They say you miss heaven by 13 inches because the belief isn't down here, it's up here. Because you've skipped repentance. You're holding on to your sin and wickedness. You don't, want, you don't want a new birth. You don't want to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. You don't want the old man to be dead and buried. You don't want to truly give your life, the old man, dead and buried, and be raised again as a new man, to be a new creature. You just have this head belief. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Confession. You confess your repentance and your belief to God. And then you ask God to save them. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? That's how you find God's grace today. But is that how you found God's grace in the Old Testament? We're going to go through the Garden of Eden and before the flood. It's the first two parts of two dispensations we're going to go through in this study. It's probably going to be a long one. So buckle in, get your Bibles. You can break up and watch it in parts. But that's what we're going to be doing. Okay? Romans 3.23, so we have repentance, but what's the point of repentance? Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's why we need repentance. And we're going to find out in the first dispensation, there was sin in the first dispensation. There was a that God gave him a chance to repent. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, as we go through here, one thing you ask yourself is the gospel, this, how to find God, the gospel, what's the gospel? How to find God's grace. Is the gospel the same in every dispensation? The gospel is not death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel, when you look up the Bible, when it talks about the gospel, it's how God saves man by his grace. How you find God's grace. Is the gospel the same in every dispensation? How you find God's grace. We're going to... Keep that in question as we go through this. Because the people that teach it, it's the same. There is no dispensation. The Bible's the same all the way through. And, and they're, the old people before the cross were looking forward to the cross. And people after the cross were looking... They don't want you going through this, the Bible and doing a study for yourself. They want you to be ignorant. But Jesus Christ, we're going to go through the Bible. We're going to see just how much they were looking forward to the cross. They didn't know nothing about Jesus until he went down... That's the whole point of him having to go down to Abraham's bosom to free them, the Old Testament saints, and lead captivity captive and lead them to heaven. It took Jesus Christ going down and preaching to them and getting them. If they were looking forward to the cross, the moment he died, they should have just beamed up. But they didn't because they weren't looking forward to the cross. They still needed to be preached to by Jesus Christ, God the Father, going down, to, er, going down and preaching to them. Through Jesus Christ. So is the gospel the same in every dispensation? Keep asking yourself as we go through these different dispensations. The way to find God's grace, that's what the gospel is. Is it the same? We're going to find out the answer is no. I'll give you a, I'll do a spoiler alert. The answer is no, it isn't. But they'll have you believe it is. They prey on the ignorance of people that don't know their Bible. That don't read the, the Bible perversions. They don't even know their Bible perversion, because if they knew their Bible perversion, they'd see how many holes and errors and how many attacks it has on the deity of Jesus Christ. They'd get rid of those Bible perversions and find God's true word of God, God's truth, the King James Bible, if they knew the Bibles that they had in their hand. But these wolves in sheep's clothing in these Babel buildings, behind the camera, um, TV evangelists, but now the TV evangelists kind of move towards behind the camera online, um, they pray on the ignorance. They don't want you to know the Bible. So make sure you're asking these questions we're going through. Does every dispensation end in an apostasy? I've been taught that, and we're going to go through this. I do believe it does, yeah. An apostasy. In other words, it, it ends with 
mankind in some way getting really bad and turning against God. Getting really bad. Okay? In some way. Okay? And God has to do something that brings in a new dispensation. Okay? He changes a little bit on how to find God's grace. How to find His grace. He does something to wake man up, you know, kind of like a jolt, to see if he can get more people saved. God's all about saving mankind from the beginning. To, we're going to find out from the beginning all the way to the all the way through the day of the Lord. God's all about His grace, and He's all about saving mankind by His grace. Amen. But mankind has been given a free will. And he needs to make the decision to follow the proper steps that God lays out to find his grace. Right. So, uh, let's find out. First dispensation, we're going to talk about the Garden of Eden. Turn back to Genesis. We're going to do Genesis 2. Genesis 1, you're going through the creation of everything. Genesis 2, we're going to talk about the creation of man. Right. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God, Lord God, some people still attack me on this, but the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, there's but one capital G God, the Father. And there's one capital L, Lord, Jesus Christ. The Lord God, Jesus Christ, who is God, the Father. The one and the same. Formed man of the dust of the ground. What do we read in the New Testament? That Jesus Christ created all things. God the Father, through Jesus Christ, His body, created all things. But people still get on to me for that. Lord God. You see, Lord God is Jesus Christ, who is God the Father. That's God the Father dealing with mankind through, through, through His body, the Lord. All right? Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breath breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, body, soul, spirit. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God's creating all these things. Now when he created Adam, and then later Eve, he created them spiritually alive. The body's connected to the soul. We talked about this. I had all the, di the different things up here. The body is connected to the soul. The soul is connected to the spirit. And they're perfect. They are spiritually alive in fellowship with God. And then after the fall, what happens? You sever, they sever, you sever the line between the body, the body I'm sorry, the soul and the spirit, you sever the line, and they become spiritually dead. Something's now gotten in the way of their fellowship with God. Sin. They're now spiritually dead, and when their body's now getting sinful and wicked, it taints the soul. The body and the soul are connected. Now that's the condition of man, after the fall. So before the fall, how did they find God's grace? Uh, get down to Genesis 2.15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely. Now stop here for a second. When you ask yourselves, is the salvation the same? How can Adam and Eve confess their sins when they haven't sinned yet? Well, I need Jesus' blood uh, shed on the cross to wipe my sins that are non-existent away. Okay, Adam and Eve were perfect. That's why you have Adam, the first Adam, and then Jesus comes and he's called the second Adam. Adam before the fall is perfect. Spiritually alive. Perfect fellowship with God. God's walking in the garden and talking with them. Perfect fellowship with God. But it says here, go back to 16, And the Lord had commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. What did we just say? The, the whole purpose of man, the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep His commandments? He's not commanding that you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, Adam and Eve, and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. 
That's not what the command was. The command isn't, obey the gospel, talking about the gospel for today. We are commanded today to obey the gospel. But Adam and Eve being, is that the command? No. What's the command? Let's read it again. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. That's the command. You don't eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. There's the fear. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. It was there in the garden. And they'll try to talk it that way. Oh, that's not about... Brothers, it's Christ. Use the Holy Spirit in you and trust his word. Verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. The reason I did that is that Eve is created. So Adam's given the command, and he passes the command to Eve. It's a help meet. So Eve comes to him. What are we supposed to do? Okay, here's how we're, Adam's like, here's how we're supposed to live. And God told me this tree over here, and he's the one that passes that on to, to Eve. But that's the command, and this, this, the first dispensation, the world gets created, man gets created, the first dispensation starts. What's the command? Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What is salvation? As long as you don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you won't die. Eternal life. They have the tree of life. Eternal life. Okay. There we got the command. Uh, then you read 3, uh, 1 through 7. We'll read this a little bit. What happens? Someone comes along and tempts them. You notice that there's temptation in almost every dispensation? Right? Either by the, uh, in every dispensation, there's temptation, whether it's by the flesh or by an evil spirit, Satan and his evil spirits. There's always some kind of temptation in every dispensation. Chapter 3. See, there's a lot of things that are the same in a lot of dispensations. But how do you find God's grace? That's how you found God's grace. He created them, provided for them, gave them eternal life. That's God's grace. Adam and Eve did nothing to earn the life that they were living before the fall. They didn't earn it. They did nothing to earn it. Everything that God was doing for them. But if they wanted to keep from losing it all, there was works involved. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If, there was a, if they did that bad work, they lost everything. And they did. Uh, chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than the beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. You know there's nothing new under the sun, brothers and sisters in Christ? Nothing new in the sun. You know that same attitude, yea, hath God said, is in every dispensation? Yea, hath God said. Right? Did God really mean what he said? Well, did God really mean what he said, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die? Did God really mean that we need to actually repent and believe? Maybe we can just believe and just have head belief. Did God really mean that that the salvation that's in the King James Bible, that that's the only way to heaven? Did he really mean that? Or, you know, in the time of Jacob's trouble, did God really mean that if any man take the mark? No, no, he didn't mean any man, only specific man. You can still take the mark and be just fine. Yea, hath God said. Oh, we can do whatever we want in the Old Testament. Oh, we can turn from God's commandments. Oh, we can do this. We can do that. Oh, it's not. Yea, hath God said. It's there in every dispensation, brother, says Christ. Yea, hath God said. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. He, 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 he made a straw man argument. He said that... Uh, you shall not eat of every, you're not allowed to eat any tree in the garden. Is that what did Jacob God said? Did God say that? Well, no, God didn't say that. You can eat of every tree in the garden except for one. That's what God said. Verse 2 And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Verse 4 And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. What did he just do there? 
Yay, hath God said, he tries to use a trick question, and you'll get that a lot today. There's nothing new under the sun. All the attacks I've had on here, when you answer the question, they'll try to reword the question. It's the same question, and they try to reword it to mess you up. All the attacks on this book, the King James Bible, about it being a perfect written word of God, have been asked and answered. And today they keep trying to worm their way in and reword it, reword it in a way that makes them look good. Trying to reword it in a way that the answer makes them right. It's the same question. They're wrong. This is right. They're wrong. That's the same answer every time. This is right. You're wrong. This is right. You're wrong. You just rewarded the same question. This is right. You're wrong. But look what, what uh, Satan did here. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. What did he do? He, call, he called God a liar. He brought into question the commandments of God. Fear God, keep his commandments. It's the whole duty of man. Adam and Eve, fear God and keep his commandments. What's he doing here? Think about this, brothers and sisters Christ, almost in every dispensation. What's he doing here? He's trying to take away the fear Remember, fear God. Keep his commandments. What's he doing? Yeah, yeah, I won't surely die. What's he do? He takes away the fear. What happens when you stop fearing God? The next step that's almost guaranteed to happen that every time when you stop fearing God, you stop keeping his commandments. And we're going to see that here. And the servant said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Oh, he's just jealous. He doesn't want you being like him. He's trying to hold something back from you. How many times have heard that before with these people? God just doesn't want us to have that much fun. Your God, which I don't believe in, just doesn't want me to have as much fun. He's trying to keep stuff from me. He's trying to hold me back. Oh, yeah. These gods knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, now stop. When she's looking at the tree, when she used to look at the tree, this was her state. Fear God, keep his commandments. Now when she's looking at the tree, what happens? No fear of God. And is it really a commandment? Or is he just being jealous? Or is he trying to withhold something? He's trying to keep something from me that I deserve. I deserve to do this. I deserve to have this. I deserve... See, her whole attitude of how she looked at the tree changed because of Satan's lies and his temptation. And that's what Satan is doing in every dispensation up to today, brother says Christ. He takes the fear away from man. Man stops fearing God. And when man stops fearing God, what happens? He stops keeping his commandments. I mean, you look at this nation. We used to have the Bible in government. We used to have the Bible in the schools. We used to have prayer in the schools. We based our laws around the Bible. The Ten Commandments are right here. Right? What did they do? They got the fear of God out. They had to get the fear of God out. And when they got the fear of God out, what happened next? They got God's commandments out. And this nation, look at this nation. I'm getting ahead of myself, but this nation is, it looks like the, before the time of Jacob's trouble. I mean, not time, it is. I said it wrong. It looks like before the flood. And the flood is a representation of us going up. It's also a representation of, because um, we're going to talk about Enoch going up. It's a representation of um, Noah, uh, God protecting 144,000 Jews through that time period. Okay. But you see how it works, brothers and Christ? You never stop fearing God. The moment you stop fearing God, pride comes in and you know better than God. And you start straying from His Word, His commands, and you stop hiding His Word in your heart and living it. You're in a whole mess, heap of mess, brothers and Christ. That's what the lost world loves to do. That's how Eve got deceived. He took, he took the fear of God away from her. Then he brought into question the commandment. Was it really that important? He's trying to hold something back from you. He's trying to keep something that you deserve. Yeah. 
Verse 6, And the, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Verse 7, And their eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were, they were naked. Remember, being naked is a sin, period. But they didn't know it. And the Bible says, where there is no law, there is no transgression. There is no transgression. They were still considered perfect, even though they were naked. But now that they ate from the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, now they know that they're naked. They know that the naked is wrong. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Okay? But here's a question. A lot of people attack the Bible by saying, but they didn't die. The Bible said to him, spiritually they died. Spiritually they died. Now we're going to keep reading. They were also worthy of physical death. But by God's grace, getting ahead of myself, God's grace, he saves them. Genesis 3.8. Let's keep going. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. You can't hide yourself from God the Father. You can't hide yourself from the Holy Spirit. So what's this talking about? God's physical body, just going over that again, God has a physical body and it's walking in the garden. I believe it's Jesus Christ. Before he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. God the Father's body, before he sacrificed his incorruptible body for a corruptible one. Okay? And if you look in the Bible, talk about the angel of the Lord. Look at the, some of the things the angel of the Lord did. Okay? It's an incorruptible body. Right? But he gave up that incorruptible body. But it's God. That's just the whole side study we already did. The presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Abraham and said, Where art thou? Now stop here for a second. This is my belief. I believe it. You can deny it or you can just... You can have your, something different because I can't be 100% dogmatic because it doesn't say this is what he's doing, but I believe this is what he's doing. What's God doing here? God knew where Adam was and where Eve was. He knew it. He knew what they had done. This is God Almighty we're talking about here. So then why is he asking, where art thou? He's given him a chance to repent. To come clean. And repent. When they saw God, they could have fallen on their knees before Him. The moment they saw Jesus walk in the garden, they could have ran to Him, fell on their knees, and said, Lord, we failed You. Lord, we did what You told us not to do, Lord. What kind of fear is here right now? The fear of consequence. Right? That's what I believe. It's the fear of consequence. They don't fear God as far as the, fear, the way they feared God before they ate the, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, now they're afraid of what he's going to do because they broke his law. Consequences. Okay? But God knew what they were doing. He was giving them a chance to come clean. Genesis 3.10 And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, Adam. I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself because of sin. I hid myself. Spiritually dead. That there's something getting in the way of their fellowship with God. Instead of being able to walk with God and talk with God, now because of sin, he's hiding from God. Sin always gets between you, brothers and sisters of Christ, and your walk with the Lord every time. You can fall into sin, and immediately God, your conscience... The laws of God, the Holy Spirit bears witness with your conscience, and you say, what I did was wrong, and you can repent right away, and you continue with your walk, and it's almost like a, you barely stumbled. But there's times where you get into sin and wickedness, and you start holding on to that sin and wickedness, and God really has to smack you upside the head to get you to let go. King David said, if I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. You can still be a saved sinner and have a great relationship, great fellowship with the Lord today. It's when you hold on to that sin and you start hiding from the Lord. You're holding on to that sin. That sin gets in the way of your Bible reading. That sin gets in the way of your uh, prayer. That sin gets in the way of your Bible studies. One sin tends to beget another sin and another sin. 
Okay? Next thing you know, you're really out of fellowship with God, and it's almost like you're hiding from God. You didn't intend to. It just seems like it happened. I just stopped reading. I stopped praying. I stopped talking to God. I got so fixated on this world and the sin of this world. Sin will always get in the way of you and the Lord, and we see that here. Right? And he said, this is God speaking, Who told thee that thou, art, thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I command thee that thou shouldst not eat? Notice when he first said, Where art thou? There's a chance to repent. Did Adam repent? No, he just said, I'm hiding from you because I found out I was naked. Sin got in the way, and he's like, I'm hiding because I'm scared. He didn't repent. What's going on here? You say, well, why would God ask this? God knew what they had done. He knew what happened. It's God. Why did he do this? He's given them a second time a chance to repent. But this is Christ. We're going to find this throughout the Bible, that God, when he looks at the heart... He gives you a chance to repent. If the heart is so hardened, we're going to see this in sometimes in the Old Testament, the heart is so hardened that He's given you plenty of times before the heart got hardened, but He sees how hard your heart is. Okay, fine. You want the world? You can have the world. It's only going to lead you to hell. If the wages of sin is death, the wages of sin is death. You're not going to die on the spot, but it's spiritual death, and it's heading to hell. That's the cost of sin. Dying spiritually, losing fellowship with the, your Creator, and going to hell. That's the cost of sin. And then to the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. God knew what they did, but he, yet He asked them again. All right. Genesis 4.12, let's keep going. And the man said, The woman whom thou givest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. So after the second time he gives Adam a chance to repent, what does Adam do? Does he repent? No. What does he do? He blames God. How many people today blame God for all their problems, all their mistakes? There's nothing new. I'm going to keep saying this a lot, brother says Christ. There's no, the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. There isn't. From Adam and Eve... To today, you have men that when they get into a huge mess, instead of falling on their knees and humbling themselves and falling on their knees in repentance, what do they do? They blame God. Adam also blamed his wife. So they blame God and they blame everybody else except the one person that was at fault. The woman that thou gavest me to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. 13. So then God goes to the woman. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? Eve, fall on your knees. Take full responsibility, fall on your knees and repent. Does she do that? No. And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. She blamed the serpent. It's not my fault, Lord. It's his fault. It's that pesky serp uh, serpent's fault. It's Satan's fault. Now, Satan does a lot of tempting, and Satan is worthy of hell. Why was hell created? It was created for the devil and his angels. So, yeah, he's got his rightful place that he's going to someday. Absolutely. We're all going to be praising God and celebrating on that day. But ultimately, when we get tempted, whether it's by Satan, evil uh, spirits, by the flesh by this wicked world. When we get tempted, we choose to sin, and if we choose to sin, whose fault is it? Our own. Doesn't matter what the serpent said. Did you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, yeah, you're guilty. You're the one that's at fault. Same thing with Adam. No, no, the wife, she, she, no, d the wife could have told you to eat a million times. You could have told her no a million times. Did you eat of the tree? Yes. It's your fault. And that's the hard thing for brothers and sisters. Christ, that's the hard thing for us before we got saved. Even as a saved sinner, I guess when I start doing things I shouldn't or thinking things I shouldn't, you really got to lower yourself 
your, your pride, you've really got to come to the Lord and humble yourself and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I just, I just disappointed you again, Lord. I let you down again. It's my fault, Lord. I'm without excuse. I can't remember. I'm going through the Bible now. And there was a guy that was, that, was, that was sitting there saying, when he was getting scolded, he sits there and he says, I have no words. What's he saying? I'm without excuse. There's nothing I can say, Lord. I'm guilty. I did those things. I was, I'm wrong. I'm guilty. I'm without words. Right? Brothers and sisters in Christ, we're going to find out when we get into the repentance as, as doctrine that repentance started here. God gave Adam and Eve a chance to repent, and repentance is in every dispensation, as we're going to find out, and it's for today. And it goes at the beginning, before you get saved, is where repentance starts, and it continues until the catching away of the body of Christ. You're supposed to live a life of repentance. Don't be like Adam and Eve were. It's not my fault, it's their fault. Oh, God, it's not my fault. It's your fault. Oh, don't ever become like that, brother. This is Christ. They've forgotten who God is. Adam did, trying to blame God. What happened? What was the first thing that God, Satan did? Took the fear of God away. Now they're afraid of the consequences, but once again, where's the fear of God himself? God Almighty. Now, there were, we're going to skip this part, but there was uh, punishments. Okay? The, the wife is now under the authority of her husband. We find out in the New Testament the reason that is is because she was deceived. Adam wasn't. Okay? And the ba bearing children, it's going to be painful. It's one of the punishments. Adam now has to work the ground. Before, the ground just gives the fruit like that. They go around. There's fruit everywhere. There's food there. He doesn't have to do work that way. He keeps and dresses the garden, but he doesn't have to work for his food. Now he's going to have to work hard. Food and raiment. The Bible talks about with food and raiment, there with be content. Mankind from that point on has to work hard to provide for his own. And it's hard work. Toiling the ground. Fighting the ground for food. Right? But people say, well, they died spiritually. Why didn't they die physically? They deserve to die physically. Absolutely. But why didn't they? Genesis 3.21 Genesis 3.21 Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins, skins, and clothe them. Explain to me how you can make coats of skins without shedding blood. Brother says Christ, how can you make coats of skin without shedding blood? Oh yeah. What's going on here? Blood had to be shed. Something had to die that was innocent, and blood had to be shed to cover their sins, so they wouldn't die physically. And what was the sin that was being covered? I mean, this is two-part, physically and spiritually. What was the sin being covered physically? They were naked. Naked is a sin. What, this is an ultimate teaching showing in the, in the Old Testament that our sins, their sins are being covered. He made clothes to cover their sin, their shame, their nakedness. Blood had to be shed, and in the Old Testament, the blood that was shed before Jesus Christ's death on the cross covered their sin, covered their shame, but didn't take it away. They still had to be kicked out of the garden. They still had to be prevented from eating from the tree of, the, of life, which you keep reading and you find that out. Okay. Now here's the thing. This is a sign of God's grace. God could have killed him and started all over. How many times did he say he could do that? Moses, I'm going to kill the Jewish people and start all over with you. I'm tired of them. I'm going to kill them and start all over with you. The flood, he killed all the world, but he saved, one, the, the, saved Noah his wife, his son, and his son's wife. His three sons and his three sons' wives. But he destroyed the world because of sin. We're going to get into that. Uh, John the Baptist says, God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. God could have wiped him out and started all over. But he didn't. Why? God's grace. 
God's grace is there. Oh, he's just so mean. God's grace is there. They're worthy of death. Okay? The wages of sin is death. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. Sin leads to hell and the lake of fire. Sin of the flesh in this life leads to your flesh getting destroyed to the point where it could die. Leads to death. The physical cost, the spiritual cost of sin. But God's grace was there. So we see God's grace is there. And God's the one that does the saving. It starts out, God made him the coats of skin. God did the animal sacrifice. God did the saving. And ever since, it's always been that way. God does the saving. You cannot save yourself. You can't bribe him with your head belief. You can't bribe him with your works. You can't bribe him with worldliness, wealth. you got to come to him broken. Amen. God still had grace for Adam and Eve. And God made him coats of skin. And in Genesis 3.22 we read, keep reading, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. And this is what I've taught. At this point, when he ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he now has the laws of God written on their hearts. That's how they knew they were naked. God, who was the one that knew the laws of God, the, the law of uh, the knowledge of good and evil. He knows what's right. He knows what's wrong. Now they do too. They have his laws written on their heart. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed him east of the Garden of Eden and he placed east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now this is how we end the first dispensation. All right. Now, is the gospel of the Garden of Eden the same gospel for today? Oh, it's always the same. Was Adam and Eve looking forward to the cross? No. Adam and Eve, in order to be saved, you need to, you need to, you need to repent and believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Is that the gospel then? No. The command, the, how they kept from losing their salvation, was not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Is there a tree of knowledge of good and evil today, brother, says Christ? No, no, no there isn't. Amen. So we know that, and they weren't looking forward to the cross. They don't mention Jesus. They don't mention his blood. Right? God's the one that had to shed blood, and he shed an innocent animal to make them coats to cover their sins. Brothers of Christ, don't be deceived. Do not be deceived. They were not looking forward to the cross to be saved. God's the one that saved them by His grace by making them coats of skins to cover their nakedness, their shame, their sin. Blood was shed. Does this dispensation end in apostasy? Yes. They were driven out. We just read that. They were driven out from the garden. They, they did what they weren't supposed to. They went against God. Apostasy. Was there sin involved? Yes. Was God's grace involved? Yes. Was repentance involved? Yes. And as we learned with Satan, we're going to find out, is temptations involved? Yea, hath God said is involved. And then calling God a liar, doing everything he can. Taking the fear of God away so you don't keep his commandments is involved. Mm -hmm. Now they grow old and die because they can't get to the tree of life. I was going to keep going, but this has been going on for a little bit. We'll get into the, we'll just do a video on each dispensation. Okay? And we're going to probably go through that first part on each dispensation to explain what to remember to keep. But in this first dispensation that we talked about, brothers and Christ, God dispenses grace differently. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you get my grace. And then after they lost his grace, God still said, you know what? I'm still going to give it back to them 
and he, commit, he did an animal sacrifice, made coats of skin, and drove them from the garden. They didn't have to physically die. Spiritually, they died. They lost God's grace there. But physically, they didn't die. Why? Because I believe God had grace for them. Satan was ruining things up. They're still guilty. There were still punishments. But that pesky Satan, God had grace for Adam and Eve. So we're going to end this with um, grace and peace. From God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and we'll get into the next dispensation. I might be putting out some studies in between but we'll get into the next dispensation and we're going to find out are all those things still there in the next dispensation. And the next dispensation is that the same gospel is for today. So thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.